Hi there, this is Joyce Graf uh, from the Brookline Senior Center, and I'm at home in my quilting room. I, and I wanted to show you today some of the techniques for free motion quilting. So I have a quilt here that I've already done the straight stitching part, the stitching in the ditch, and actually I've already bound it. But what I have yet to do is to go around some of the design areas of this quilt. Um, get one of the pieces up to show you. So here is one of the design blocks and there are also some of the pieced blocks that are used in the quilt. And I'm gonna go around that. Um, you should always read the directions on the batting that you're using. And it will usually tell you how uh, much distance you should go without any quilting. You don't need to have quilting every one inch, but it'll tell you, for example, that you should have quilting at least every four inches. So read the package and see what it says. The purpose of this quilting is to keep the batting from shifting. When you go, go in the wash or something like that, the batting sometimes will try to shift around and you don't want it to do that. Now you can see I've used patterned backing and I used a gray thread, which kind of recedes into thing. It's pretty neutral. And the gray is gonna work well on the front. I might even see if I have a green that would work well. So we'll see what I come up with. But generally I like using a, a gray neutral and you can see I've used it around these stripes, the gold stripe and the brown stripe and you really can scarcely see it. So that's the objective. I don't want to have the quilting be a primary focus. I want it to be a secondary focus. Two things that we achieve. One, we keep the batting from shifting. That's number one. The other thing is that you make the design sort of pop. So for example, looking at this cute little raccoon, He's totally flat. Once we go around him, we're gonna make him pop a little bit. We'll, he'll stand out, he'll look a tiny bit puffy. Not very, because I'm using an all cotton batting, so he's, it doesn't have a lot of what they call loft. And it doesn't stick up. It's, it's not as thick as a lot of batting, but um, it's comfortable and warm. That's the objective. But we, we will make some of these design areas pop a little bit when we go through it. Now I've set up my area so that, and I'll switch to the other camera so you can see better as I'm working. So here's the working area. And I've pulled my table out from the wall so that I can flop it over the entire area. Keeps more on the table and out of my way. So let's see. Let's start with some of these more straight areas. And you can see when I did the straight lines, I was able to go like this and just completely go in a straight line. The closer you get to the middle, the more of, a, of an issue that becomes. But the other thing is that if I were going to just try to do this with the presser foot and the feed dogs engaged, pulling my fabric at a regular pace, I would need to turn the, to turn the fabric in order to go the next straight line direction. So for example, I'd be going like this, and then I'd turn the quilt to come back this way. And that becomes a real issue. So instead, I'm gonna do what's called free motion quilting. And instead of 
having the presser foot and the feed dogs moving the material for me. I'm going to move the material with my hands. And you can see I've put on, these are plain cotton gloves. These are very inexpensive cotton gloves. You can get ones with little bumps on them. Uh, there are many brands of quilters gloves. But I discovered sort of by accident that these cotton gloves work just as well. The objective is that you need to be able to move the material. If I use just my hand, see my hand slides across the material. But if I use these gloves, then I can move the material. So that's the objective. You want to be able to move the material freely under the foot. So we're going to move it. When you have the feed dogs working for you, it's pulling the material for you at a particular pace. When you're doing free motion quilting, the needle's just going up and down. That's all the machine is doing for you. The length of the stitch is determined by a combination of the speed at which the needle goes up and down and the speed at which you move the material. So the needle is just going up and down and I have to move the material so that the next stitch is just that 10th of an inch beyond where we started. So I think I'm gonna start here, right where this peak begins because I've already got this straight line already in there. I'm going to come up like that to the peak, down again. Let's see if I go like that and like this. Go over to this peak and then turn around and come back. All right, and then we'll do the next, um, the next band inside of it. So a couple of tools that I always keep handy. One is a way to cut the thread ends and I'm only cutting the thread so some any kind of a little nipper is great and it's convenient and with my glove on my hands are a little clumsy so I like having something that I don't need to manipulate with my fingers I can just squeeze it. So this is one style and the nice thing about this style See how the blades are angled so that it's almost impossible to cut the material. You put it so that the rounded end is down against your material and all you're doing is snipping the thread. So these are handy to have. The other thing is to have a seam ripper. This style of seam ripper has a nice big fat handle. So again, for hands that are more arthritic or clumsy or whatever, um, this is a good style. It's easier to grasp. And I don't use it a lot and certainly not for seam ripping at this point, but once in a while you need to unbury a thread. So it's a handy gadget to have close at hand. All right, so now I think you can see I have my darning foot installed and every machine has a slightly different darning foot and instructions. So be sure to read the instructions for your particular machine and set it up. But there are a couple of things that are consistent amongst them. One is that you have some way of engaging this foot against the needle holder. So there's a little hook that hooks up. Let's see if I can, let's see if I can find the picture. So here's a picture of the darning foot for my machine. I have a FAF 150 Expressions machine. And it has a post that goes into the little hole that holds your accessories in the back. Um, you put it through the hole, you hook it over the needle holder pin. And uh, so it, it's attached now. Let me see, I'll get a little closer so you can see it. So it's attached. 
How's that? Not too bad. So it has this plastic arm that goes behind the needle post. This holds the needle in place. So it attaches it and it senses when the needle is going up and down. It, the accessory hole is back here. It's governed by this little screw in the back. And so I've got the pin on the arm that goes through the hole and screws in nice and tight so it doesn't come off. And again, they're all different. So read what your own machine says about what you should be doing. All right. So that arm is going to allow us to go up and down uh, at a particular pace with the machine. Um, your feed dogs are not going to be use, useful. You can either drop them down, which I'm going to do right now, just to get them out of the way, or you can ignore it. Mine works fine, whether I put the feed dogs up or down, but um, you may want to adjust that. The other thing is when you go back to normal function, don't forget to put your feed dogs back up. So right now, these, these little crenellated things that normally would move the fabric, we're not going to use them because we're going to do that work. Now, when you engage your darning foot, there will be some way for you to put down the presser foot. When you put down the presser foot, it engages the thread tension. So it's important to have the presser foot in a down or semi-down position. And on my machine, there's a little way that I can move a, a, a lever in the back. Now it's not gonna come all the way to the floor. It's gonna come sort of semi-down, but it's enough to engage the thread tension so that the thread is moving at a particular regulated pace. So we've got the thread tension engaged and we're ready to start. So I'm gonna start by putting my needle down in exactly the right position where I want to begin. And when I start my line of stitching, I'm going to make a few stitches right on top of each other to secure the thread so that you don't have to tie it. It is possible you can go back and pull them to the back and tie them, but I find it more convenient to simply overstitch a couple of stitches and then go. So here we go. And then remember I said it's a combination of the paste at which you glue the material and the speed of the machine. So here I'm going fairly slowly so you can see it. And one of the nice things about this machine, and maybe yours, is that I can tell it to stop in the down position. And that's particularly helpful when I'm doing this because then if I need to stop and take my hands off and do something else, it's not gonna move. I've secured the fabric by having the needle down. Okay, I'm up at the tip, got my needle down. I'm gonna change direction. And then needle's going a little faster, so I'm moving a little faster. Stopping because I was stretching as far as I care to stretch, and now I'm moving back again. So you, you can see I'm using two hands. I'm using my arms. Okay, and now I'm going to change direction. Now notice that my right hand is right up against the housing of the machine. So I needed to move my hand. So I stopped the machine. And now I'm going over again. Okay. 
So now I don't have to turn the material to change directions. I can just steer the fabric under that needle. Okay, and now I lift up the needle and I can move to the next place I want to go. Now, notice that when I'm pulling on the material, the thread doesn't want to go, and that's because the thread tension is engaged. So if I lift up the presser foot, I can draw the, fat, the thread more easily. And now I'm going to put it down again. And now I have to engage my thread tension, so I need to put that presser foot in its halfway down position. And we're off and again. I've got the needle up, so I had to hold the material nice and steady until I put it down. Up to the tip, change your direction. Okay, up, lift. down again. So the presser foot has to come down at least to that halfway position. I'll put my needle down. Let's see, we've got some squirrels over here. And what do I want to do? And don't forget, my goal is that I'm going to have stitching about every four inches. So I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to go around this one squirrel and then hop over and go around the other squirrel. And that's going to take care of it pretty well. This is a, a four inch gap, more than four inch gap. So it's possible to do a little bit of something in the middle. Um, but that's probably the only problematic area that I have. Okay, so I've got this little squirrel to do. And I think I like to start at a, a V, the point of a V. So I think I'm going to start right here where his arm meets his body. And I'm going to put my needle down right in that spot. And you notice I haven't cut any threads. I just carried it. And again, I need to put my needle down. All right. I'm going to start by going around the little arm. So I'm just wiggling my fabric under that needle. And it looks like I've just lost my bobbin thread. So here I was telling you about how I hadn't yet um, I hadn't done anything with the um, cut the thread at all. But here, now I'm going to cut the top thread. I've just lost the bobbin thread. I ran out of bobbin, in other words. So we're going to change the bobbin. 
And I believe I have another bobbin already prepared. I do. Good. All right, so we have another bobbin. And you can see these little tools are useful for more than one thing. And now I'm going to go down and up. And draw my bobbin thread up. And now we're ready to go again. Now, as I get toward the center of the quilt, I've got more and more bulk to manage next to the housing. So I'm rolling that up a little bit. my gloves back on. Now, if I drop the needle about a half inch back from where I was. Now my needle is already in the needle down position. So optimally you do this with telling the machine to put the needle down and that way it'll stop in the needle down position. All right, so we're ready to go. And I, I'll just pick that up so you can see one more time that I've stopped about half inch from where I was before. Want my needle in the down position, have the presser foot in the down position and we're gonna go and we're gonna start by over sewing that one stitch a couple of times and now I'm just moving along. Needle's already down. And I'm not going around every finger. My hands bumping the housing again, so I'm moving my hands. And now I was having trouble moving the fabric a little bit. Sometimes you have to free it up in the back so that it'll slide smoothly. Now I'll show you, see how that's made my squirrel pop a little bit. So it just outlined him a little bit more, makes his image a little bit more prominent, pulls him away from the flat part. Now let's see, I think I wanna start here. Needle down, press her foot down.
Now, do I want to do this leaf? Maybe. Yeah, I think maybe I will. All right, up and up. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do this one top leaf down and down, needle down, press her foot down. If I don't do the press foot, I'll actually, I'll show you what happens if you don't put the press foot down, because you will undoubtedly do that at least once. So I'll show you what that does. Yeah. All right, so now I'm just going to stop here for a second. I have to cut both the top thread and the bottom thread. And this is where this scissors actually is particularly wonderful because I can go under the fabric, use the curved side toward the fabric, and snip that thread without cutting my fabric. All right, let me just move this out of the way for a minute. I want to show you what happens if you forget to put the um, if you forget to put the presser foot down because don't forget I, I mentioned that the presser foot governs the tension. So if I just put the needle down and I forget to put the presser foot down, here's what happens looks good from the top, right? But you have a mess on the bottom. It's a total mess. Here, I'll show, show you closer to the camera so you can see. Uh, sometimes it'll just be a whole series of loops, but you can see that the, the tension is wrong. Here I have a loop. Here I have a straight line. This is not good. So now I'll do it and put the presser foot down the way it's supposed to be. Needle down, presser foot down, and so another circle up, up, trim my thread. So now on this circle, you can see that the stitches are even. Over here, the stitches are completely mucked up. So that's what will happen. Sometimes it'll just look like loop-de-loop -loop all over the back and you get to tear it out at that point. There's nothing to do but tear it out and do it again. So don't do that. Um, that's just to tell you what happens. It's a very common mistake. Been there, done that many times. All right, now I've got two thirds of my quilt to the right of where I want to be. So I'm going to turn it around. Now I have less bulk to manage against the housing and we're going to do what we did before and do these Peace stripes. Needle down. Press her foot down. So it just takes practice. One of the things I like to do when, when I'm practicing this is to take a, a children's panel and make a baby quilt and just outline the designs. So if there's a teddy bear, you go around the teddy bear. And then you go around the lion, and then you go around the monkey. It's just like working with a coloring book. But instead of staying inside the lines to color, 
be staying on the lines to stitch. The other thing you'll see me doing is I want to make sure that it's nice and smooth going forward. So the area I'm going to be working on, which is this, you can see I framed it with my fingers and made sure it's nice and smooth so I'm not going to have any lumps and lumps in it. side I have a bird here and again let's sort of scope it out we've got a bird to do we've got one bird here and one bird here and then there's going to be a gap so here's my four inch measure it could use a little something up in here Maybe I'll do one of these flowers or maybe the these pansies. Hmm, what do you think? All right, so I'm going to find myself a strategic location to start. Down and down. And the reason I stopped then was I felt like I was too far away from the design area where I wanted to work and I'm wiggling a lot. So I'm moving my hands in closer. Now I want to go around his head and his feet. do something over in here. Hmm. Interesting. So what I'm think, looking at is what's in the foreground and what's in the background. So the things in the foreground are these two leaves. Other things are behind it. So this brown line is behind this leaf and this green leaf is behind the brown leaf. So what I want to bring forward 
with my quilting is something that's in the foreground. So I'm kind of thinking these two leaves might be what I want to bring forward. All right, let's do that. And that'll get me within my four inches. Okay, let's do that. So I've got press it foot down and needle down. So front up, and we'll come down, I think, to here. There's no real rules about it, but I do like to try to do a sort of V intersection so that when the, because the thread's going to be a little bit heavy there, where I overstitch the first and last stitches. So it makes a place where um, that would be okay to do. So now I've got my needle down, I put the presser foot down, and here we go. Now I've got his leg here. I'm going to turn and go down the leg. Where does that leg go? Oh, there it is. Okay. This is why it's handy to have these things be clear plastic, because then you can see them better. Especially when you're going backwards like that. Am I going in the right place around him? And here I have a choice to make. And I can actually do both. So let me go ahead and do both. Because I started at that V, now I can uh, actually go around the body back to my V and then do the tail. So I've made his tail sort of separate appendage from the body. I think I like it. Okay. And now we have some fishes. All right, so my center panel on this row are these fishes. And I'm ro rolling it on the right. So we have a fish, a fish, uh, a frog, and a lily pad. So these are under the surface of the water. This is on the surface of the water. So we have a frog and a, a water lily and this big lily pad. But this is actually behind, it's behind the frog and it's behind the fish. So let's not make that more prominent. Hmm. But I am going to want to do something in this corner. So maybe I'll do one of these flowers. What have we got down here? And we could do some of the things at the bottom. That might be good. Let's do a sort of row of squiggles at the bottom and do fish by fish. And again, my calculation is, am I going to have quilting every four inches? So let's start with this guy. Drop the needle. And I've got the thread tension down, the presser foot is down, the needle is down. 
And off we go. Oops, I went too far down with that. When I go too far down, then I can't move the fabric. So better too far down than not far enough. In. Just in. Just in. Okay. So I've got him. I think I'm going to come down and do this row first. And we get to sort of doodle. Because doodling is all this really needs is one row of doodling. for a strategic location to start. I think I'm going to do it. Whoops. It's not the best place. Just come over here. And don't worry about that extra little stitch. We'll fix that in a minute. I'll show you how. to do this cute little frog and maybe a flower or two. Oh, and we've got a dragonfly over there that we could work on as well. Let's see. I think I will start here. No, that's good. Okay. Oops. Yeah, I didn't put the tension down. All right, so let's go fix that right now, because I know I have a mess on the back. Okay. All right, so first of all, we have an extra stitch here where I went down in the wrong place. I'm just going to pull him out. And this is why I like these tools. I can nip threads. Um, and the thread is going to stick to my glove. Now you may also be noticing that there are a lot of dog hairs on my gloves. Uh, this is normal in a home where you have lots of furry friends. So that's one of the reasons that after I finish a quilt like this, I will actually throw it in the wash. And people say to me, oh, you mean you can wash in one of these quilts? I say, yes, I make practical bed quilts. That's what I like to do. And yes, they are all 100% washable. So all of these little, what I call the carry threads, where I carried the thread across a gap, all those carry threads now have to go. So I'm going to take those guys off. But here... I forgot to put the presser foot down. 
So I know that where I started this frog, I have made a mess on the back. And let's go look at that. I'm just taking these carry threads off the back. Some are longer than others. And you'll be finding them for a while. All right, where's our little frog? Frog is here. So if I turn him upside down, here's my mess. Yes, it's gonna be hard for you to see this on the camera, I think. Oops. That's the bobbin thread. That's why it just got longer and longer. Okay. It's gonna be hard for you to see this, but I'm just gonna pick it out with my seam ripper. And there's the, the one sort of parallel thread, the bobbin thread that just goes in a straight line and then the loops from the top thread are coming through. I've got a ton of loopy top thread that I'm getting rid of. So I've got everything off of the back. Look at the frog from the front and he's all clean. So now I can do it again. Look at the frog back in the right position. Put my gloves on. And before I go any farther, I'm going to make sure I have enough of a tail here that my, th my needle's not going to come unthreaded. Yeah, there's good. Okay. So if you don't have enough of a tail on the top thread, it'll pull back through the needle. So you want to make sure you have at least four or five inches. All right. So I said I was going to start right about there. Okay. Yep, I think I've got it. So work at my plan of attack, so to speak. So I put the presser foot down first, so I won't forget it. Now I have to make sure I've got my foot on the accelerator down here. Okay, and I'm holding him nice and flat. And then I'm gonna go around his arm first. And now around his body. Good. All right. So we've got him. And now let's see, I think let's go around this flower. So we've got the flower. Now, should we do that dragonfly? Yeah, maybe. It also serves to call attention to the dragonfly, which I think we want to do. So I think I'll start here. Okay. 
time now. A set of it's going to do at least one of these flowers over here. We can do this one. Why don't we do that one? All right. Okay. All right. And now I've got a raccoon on my left, but I already have a lot of bulk on the right. So I could turn it around. When you're working on a bigger quilt, you'll have more bulk to manage. So um, it's not impossible to go ahead and just do the next thing on the right. But I think I'm going to choose not to just because I can. So I'm taking off some carry threads here. And let's turn the quilt around and do the raccoon. All right, so we have a cute little upside down raccoon here. We have a butterfly in this bigger space. So I think we'll do that butterfly. We'll go around the raccoon. Um, going around this raccoon face will help to pop him out from the log. So we'll definitely want to do that. And then this corner is okay. And this is going to be okay. So I think if we just do this raccoon face and this whole raccoon and the butterfly, that we'll be in good shape. Okay. So I'm going to start here, needle down, press her foot down, and we're up. here on the tail. And you, you may have noticed I had a lump growing there. That's why I wanted to shift and make sure the fabric is nice and flat. Let's go up and needle up and butterfly. Don't put it at the bottom.
So I think you have the idea now and um, just it takes practice. So um, the, what you can do is make yourself a sandwich, you know, sort of pseudo quilt. Take two pieces of fabric or like you saw me do before, just take two or three pieces of fabric folded together. But if you put some batting in between, then it makes it more like the real thing. Um, and one thing you can do is just draw a shape, just draw a teddy bear on it with a pencil and then just go around your teddy bear. Try to stay on the lines as much as you can. If it's not perfect, it's okay, but do the best you can and your animal will pop. So thanks for watching along with me. So thanks very much for watching along with me. I hope that this was helpful to you and I'll look forward to seeing what you've achieved. Thank you. Bye-bye.